In the process of mitosis, hundreds of billions of cells are formed, each with their own function. Today, we have Dr. Jenny Tenlin here, who will be talking about the evolution of germ cells and how this plays out in tardigrades. So, Dr. Tenlin, take it away. We know a lot about germ cells from studying their roles in organisms such as fruit flies, nematodes, etc. But we still have a lot of unanswered questions. For example, how did germ cells evolve? How did different animals adopt different mechanisms to make germ cells? And to get a good question, we needed to identify an organism that shared some relationship with some of the more well-studied systems, but might provide us more information on how these processes work. How do we find an organism like that? Branches highlighted in yellow here are all closely related animals. They belong to a single cluster of animals, and they all share a single common ancestor back here. And one of the cool organisms in this cluster are tardigrades. So tardigrades are closely related to both arthropods and nematodes, and have the same common ancestor as those organisms. But based on some very limited evidence that we have, it suggests that um, the tardigrades might be making germ cells in an entirely different way. So that was one reason why I really got interested in studying tardigrades or water bears, because they provide a model system that does things slightly differently and can be used to compare to what we understand about germ cells in fruit flies and nematodes. Cool. So, what are tardigrades? So, they're very simple. They're microscopic. They live, they're no longer more than maybe a millimeter in size. They live primarily in moist habitat, whether a pond or on moss or lichen that's covered with a layer of water. And in this video that was taken by my research mentor who introduced me to tardigrades, we have it mounted on a microscope slide in water. And they eat algae, so all these green specks you see in here are green algae that was added to the water as their food source. Now you can tell that they're having a little bit of trouble walking around, and that's because their legs and claws are not adapted to crawling around on glass, on like on a microscope slide. So they get kind of clumsy, and in fact, the name Tardigrada means slow walker, and that was because of the fact that they had such a hard time walking on glass slides. Now, tardigrades are best known for their ability to withstand really extreme environments. Um, they can withstand being dried out or desiccated. They can withstand really cold temperatures, really hot temperatures. And they've also been sent out into space several times now, and they can survive being exposed to vacuum of outer space and to solar radiation from the sun. And so they've kind of captured people's fancy for their ability to survive anything. So one of the reasons why we study this particular species of Fitzgibbia exemplar is, first of all, they can grow them in the laboratory. And it's kind of ironic when you think about the fact that tardigrades can survive any environment it turns out only a few species can live in a lab environment, and we have no idea why that is. It turns out Hypsibius exemplaris is one of those species that can live in a lab. The other reason why we study this particular species is because the body is what we call optically clear. You can actually see right through it when they're on a microscope. So I'm going to play a video I took. This is a female. She is laying her egg, so she has two embryos here, and she is molting. So she's actually getting rid of her old skin and growing a new skin. So right now, as I start to play this video, she's trying to crawl out of her old skin, and she's going to leave her two embryos behind, and she's going to walk away. Just to note, all of these little balls you see here are just glass beads that I put on the microscope slide so that when you cover it with a cover slip, it doesn't so I have another video that I made of two embryos that are undergoing mitosis, they're undergoing cell division. So they were just starting division at the one cell stage, now they're going to divide into the two cell stage, 
So here we can see the two cells there and in this embryo. And then those two cells will divide into four cells. After six hours, we have two embryos that each have over 40 cells in them. And by this point, we can already start to see patterns of cell movement and cell behavior that will allow us to start identifying specific tissues, such as the formation of the intestine, the formation of muscles, etc. One of the questions that I don't know the answer to yet is where are the germ cells? So we know the germ cells will be somewhere in the middle of the embryo, and we have some ideas about what specific cells make the, will become the germ cells, but we haven't identified them yet. And that's something that my lab is really interested in uncovering the answer to. And that's going to take some time before we have a definitive answer. But one of the things that we need to do in order to definitively identify the germ cells is to have a way to look for them, to have markers for germ cell identity. And we just sequenced the tardigrade genome just within the last three, four years. Um, so we know the entire DNA sequence of all the genetic material in tardigrade. However, we don't know yet what that DNA encodes. So we don't know the organization of the gene in the genome, nor do we know what those genes do in tardigrade. So as a starting point, we started to by compiling a list of germline proteins that we know in other animals are required to make germ cells. And now we're asking, do those same proteins exist in tardigrade? And if so, do they actually play any kind of role in making tardigrade germ cells? So one of the genes that I focused on is called MAGO. And MAGO is a really highly conserved gene. And by what I, what I mean by that is almost every animal has a protein called MAGO. And if you compare the protein from flies, humans, worms, etc., they are all really, really, really similar to one another. And we can identify specific roles that MAGO plays in other animals. So, for example, in fruit flies, we have evidence that if you knock out MAGO, fruit flies cannot make germ cells anymore. MAGO is also required for segmentation, for making the abdominal segments in fruit flies. In nematodes, they don't have segments, so we wouldn't expect MAGO to be required for segmentation in nematodes. But in nematodes, it is required to elongate the embryo along a head-tail axis. So, the worm starts to grow longer and longer and longer, and that process seems to require MAGO. So, since flies and nematodes are closely related to tardigrade, I can start to make prediction what I would expect to observe in a tardigrade embryo if I were to somehow knock out MAGO. So, the first thing I had to do was to find MAGO in the tardigrade genome. So I used the fly version of the MAGO protein, and that's shown on the top query line. So this line, this line, and this line all indicate the MAGO protein in fruit flies. And then I put it into a database that's operated by the National Center for Biotechnology Information. And this database is freely available. It's paid for by taxpayer dollars, and it has sequences from all sorts of organisms, including the tardigrade genome. So I asked it to search all of the tardigrade sequences to see if it could find a protein sequence that was similar to the fruit fly MAGO. And what I'm showing on the screen here is the result that came out of this search. The lower line here corresponds to the tardigrade version of MAGO. So the other thing I can learn from this is what the actual DNA sequence looks like. So I can click on this link here and that will take me right to the tardigrade gene sequence for MAGO. So now I know what the DNA looks like, and I know what the messenger RNA looks like based on this sequence. And I can use that information to try to pull this gene out of tardigrade. And we do that using a mechanism called the polymerase chain reaction. And you can think of PCR as a big copy machine. So you have a test where you add your tardigrade DNA and you add reagents that allow you to identify the specific model gene and make lots and lots and lots of copies. 
So by the time that reaction is done, you actually can have over a million copies of Mago in this really small test. And then to see if the Mago was actually made, you can use a technique called gel electrophoresis. And in gel electrophoresis, you use a material called agarose that's taken from seaweed, and the DNA will run right through the material of the agarose. And you apply an electrical current. And so DNA has a negative charge to it. We apply it so that it's going to run towards a positive pole. And by that process of separation via electrophoresis or using electricity, you can actually separate the product based on your size. And so in this gel, I have different lanes where I loaded different samples. In the first and the last lane, I loaded a ladder. And a ladder is, just, is simply a collection of bands of DNA where I know the exact size of that band. And then in all of these other lanes, I loaded um, individual PCR reactions from taken from different animals. So this is from one animal's genome, this is another animal's genome, etc. And the gene was predicted to be about 500 nucleotides, 500 base pairs of DNA. And this band in the latter is also 500 base pairs. So it looks like in all of these lanes, I have a product that appears to be Mago. In some of these lanes, the band is super faint, but there is a band there. And in these last two lanes, the um, PCR didn't work for some reason. But this is a cool result, because not only do I know what the Mago sequence is, but now I know that I can pull it out of the animal, that it is actually made into a product of this messenger RNA. So the next thing I wanted to do is ask, what would happen if I knock it out? How does Mago affect tardigrade development? So to do this, I used a technique that was developed by other researchers way back in the 1990s. And this technique is called RNA interference. And what we do is you take double-stranded RNA. So this is this RNA is specific to the thing you want to knock out. So in my case, this is double-stranded RNA that recognizes MAGO. So it has one strand that's identical to MAGO, and then it has the other strand that's like the opposite, the complementary strand to MAGO. And when you inject it into the cell, it gets chopped up into smaller pieces. And then it, the small pieces get separated so that one strand can then go to the, and find the actual MAGO messenger RNA sequences that are inside the cell. And when this fragment binds to messenger RNA, that messenger RNA is then cut up and destroyed. And since there's no more messenger RNA, that messenger RNA cannot be translated into protein. So this is a way to prevent the animal from being able to make any Mago protein. And so then, if there's no Mago protein, I can ask, what effect does that have on the animal? What effect does that have on embryo development? So what I did is I took double-stranded RNA with a, that was made specifically for Mago, and I injected them into the tardigrade. This is the microscope I use for this. This is a regular compound microscope. You may have seen something similar in your lab. Um, you have your ocular, there's your objective lenses up here, etc. So one thing that makes this different from other microscopes is we have this long needle holder right here. And there's an air line that feeds into this needle holder. So you basically push air into the needle holder and you force the air to kind of build and build and build to a high pressure. And at the other end, I have a capillary needle that has a lot of double-stranded RNA in it. And you can actually tap on the foot pedal and that releases all of the air that's building up and it forces the double-stranded RNA into the tardigrade. And what's really remarkable is they tolerate this really well. You would think having a needle stuck in you would not be a pleasant experience. But for tardigrades, they're very flexible in terms of these types of experimental manipulation. So, well, what effect did that have? So, I'm going to show you first what would happen in a normal embryo. So, this is the way normal embryos develop. Now, tardigrade embryos take a long time to develop compared to other simple organisms like worms or flies. So, it takes four days from fertilization.
visualization to hatch him, which is a long time to wait when you're trying to do experiments. But after about a day and a half, you can actually start to see elongation. So the tardigrade embryo is growing along the head to tail axis. So this A represents anterior. So this is the head end of the animal and it wraps around to the tail end, which is marked by P, which stands for posterior. And then by four days, the tardigrade is completely wrapped around on itself. And you can actually see here is the mouth. We have the pharynx. So food is going to enter through here. It's going to be crushed up in the pharynx. And then it will be passed into the intestine. And the intestine is wrapping all the way around. And there's more to the intestine underneath the mouth part that you don't see. So this embryo is completely elongated and it's getting ready to hatch. So then what happens if you get rid of Mago? So this is an example of an embryo that has no Mago protein. And this embryo is five days old. So this is five days after fertilization. And what's interesting is that there are these markers that we see, these really bright spots that tell us there's an intestine forming right here. So it's trying to make an intestine. And I know that it's also trying to make other types of cells such as muscle. But it is not elongated. It is still a very short embryo. There's no obvious head, no obvious tail. It's not wrapping around on itself. So this is kind of a cool result because this is also what we saw in nematodes. So this suggests that in the common ancestor of tardigrades and nematodes, Mago was doing something similar. It was probably affecting the elongation of the animal, um, a lot, which would normally allow the animal to grow longer, etc. But when you knock it out, these embryos are no longer able to do that. So one thing I don't know yet is whether or not Mago also affects the germ cells in tardigrade. One of the problems with this phenotype is that the embryos can't hatch. And if they can't hatch, they can't grow up into adults and reproduce. So it's possible that because they're growing up something so early in development, I wouldn't necessarily be able to see an effect on the germ cells because that's something that forms later in development. So I'm trying to figure out how do I manipulate Mago so I can get the embryo to make it far enough along the hat, but then get rid of Mago so it can't make germ cells. But this is just one example of how we study genes in tardigrade. And in the big picture, if I think about five, ten years from now, what I hope to be able to say is that we know the identity of specific proteins that make germ cells, and we can use those proteins to actually identify the germ cells in the tardigrade, and then start to make comparison to what we understand about germ cells in other organisms to better understand how these mechanisms evolved over time. Think about the fact that the entire animal of the next generation comes from these very specific cells of the previous generation. It's really cool to think about how that process might occur. So thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about tardigrade. That was a cool lecture. Thank you for sharing with us, Dr. Tenlin. I hope all of you out there watching enjoyed this video, and if you want more content like this, please subscribe to The Science Squad. Bye!